Well, good afternoon. Today there are 20,649 active cases of COVID-19 in Alberta. That's an increase of uh, 1,341 on 16,353 tests for a positivity rate of 8.2%. Uh, 742 patients are in hospital with COVID-19, 137 of whom are uh, in intensive care. Sadly, 11 more Albertans have passed away from the novel coronavirus, meaning that 744 Albertans entirely since March have lost their lives to COVID-19 since the pandemic began. And on behalf of Alberta's government, I extend my condolences to the families and friends of each and every one of those whose lives have been lost to this virus. As you know, Last night, the first 3,900 doses of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine arrived at the Calgary International Airport, and I was excited to be there in person to see that happy day finally come. They have been transported to distribution centers, unfrozen, and the first inoculations have already begun. I understand that the first to receive it, uh, just received the vaccine moments ago, uh, was respiratory therapist uh, Sarah Cahier at Edmonton's United University of Alberta Hospital, and that intensive care nurse Tanya Harvey at the Foothills Medical Center in Calgary is also receiving the vaccine as we speak. We expect to receive and begin administering another uh, 25,300 doses of the Pfizer vaccine uh, within the next week. And we are also looking forward to receiving our first uh, tranche of the Moderna vaccines uh, within a week or so. This is all wonderfully good news. Hope is here and the end of this terrible time is finally within sight. Last week, I announced strong province-wide measures that we believe will save lives, bend down the curve, and protect our healthcare system. Uh, but our data tells us that some areas of the province continue to experience very high rates of transmission. So today, we are announcing a new outreach campaign to help Albertans living in such highly affected communities. Statistical analysis conducted by Alberta Health and the Emergency Management Agency have identified 11 communities in particular with the highest rates of COVID transmission in the province, nine of which are in Edmonton and two of which are in Calgary. These areas require an additional layer of public health support over and above the measures put in place province-wide. And that's why today's announcement is, that's what it's all about. <clears throat> Albertans in these particular communities are at higher risk of COVID-19 due to absolutely no fault of the residents there. The residents of these communities often have public facing jobs which may make them more susceptible to community transmission. Now let me pause to say how much I believe all Albertans appreciate those folks who've continued to work day in and day out providing essential services in frontline jobs whether it's as care aides in hospitals or nursing homes, stocking grocery store shelves, or driving long haul trucks, and so much more, we all depend on those working hard in these and other public facing roles who often take greater health risks in order to do so, in order to serve our broader society and also take care of their families. And we must be there to support them. These heaviest hit neighborhoods tend to be lower income areas where people naturally live in higher density housing arrangements, sometimes with multi-generational families uh, that can make it very difficult for family members to self-isolate effectively if needed. And it may also, in some cases with uh, elderly relatives at home, uh, make seniors more vulnerable potentially to infection. Many of these families also have English language barriers, which in some cases may make it more difficult for them to obtain uh, current and accurate health information uh, and to access the social supports that are available to them. With an understanding of these challenges, we are establishing COVID care teams with our uh, municipal and local community partners in Edmonton and Calgary in order to provide on the ground outreach and very practical support. These teams will go right into these neighborhoods in a safe, coordinated and community minded way to ensure that residents have the understanding, the tools and the support they need to break the chain of transmission in their area. 
This is about having empathy and compassion for the very real barriers that many of those folks face and providing what they need to slow the spread in our two largest cities. Some of the things the COVID care teams will focus on include providing materials and clarification on the public health orders in the language that residents can best understand. Alberta's government will be offering care packages with masks, hand sanitizer, and relevant information delivered by those community care teams. We'll be ensuring that folks are aware on the ground of social supports, like, for example, the Canada Recovery Sickness Benefit, will help individuals who may be sick to apply for and access this uh, and get access to this and other income support programs. And this may be with families who have significant Eng English language barriers, who perhaps don't have uh, uh, computers at home to do online applications, uh, or um, may, ha may need help uh, navigating navigating through uh, the bureaucratic process to access programs like that which will help them, if necessary, stay home. A critical part of this community care initiative will be a massive expansion of free self-isolation housing support. Now back in the spring, uh, Dr. Hinshaw and her public health team concluded that most of the viral transmission that affected the uh, meatpacking plant workers during those outbreaks was likely the result of transmission outside the workplace. That is to say, in similar neighborhoods with high density households, where it was effectively impossible for people to completely self-isolate in many cases. In response, we began then offering select individuals who could not self-isolate to access 14 days in self-isolation at hotels at taxpayer expense. Uh, but since doing so in the spring, only a small number of Albertans, a few dozen, have taken us up on the offer. We believe that most people in high-density housing just are not aware of this very helpful uh, public uh, health support. And so I've directed that we massively expand this self-isolation support, particularly for people in these hardest hit communities, and that we offer strong incentives for people to participate. As a result, Alberta ha now has 16 self-isolation hotels ready for those who need them. Uh, these are, there are six in Calgary and nine in Edmonton with one up in Peace River. Currently, the maximum capacity in Calgary is, for the self-isolation hotel rooms is 791, and it's uh, over 1,300 in Edmonton. We're procuring additional ho hotel spaces in the two big cities, as well as Fort McMurray and Red Deer. Uh, if there is sufficient demand, we'll expand the program even further. These hotel accommodations will provide culturally appropriate meals. We've worked with uh, the providers, the contractors, to accommodate dietary and religious restrictions, but are also working with community organizations for meal drop-offs. The cost for both the hotel room and uh, meal support averages to about $160 per person per day. Now, obviously, people taking time away from work and family are incurring costs to do so and giving up income. And as lower-income families, these costs may be insurmountable. That's why I am also announcing today that as part of the community care campaign, individuals will be eligible for a temporary emergency payment of $625 once they have completed their self-isolation at one of the designated isolation hotels. This is the same payment that we make available to Albertans who evacuate from natural emergencies like fires and floods. So my view is that vulnerable people affected by this public health emergency who do the right thing by self-isolating need similar support to be safe. So the message is clear. If you've been asked by Alberta Health to self-isolate due to COVID-19, or even if you haven't been asked and you know that you've been a close contact or you're symptomatic, but you cannot safely self-isolate at home, we are here with real help, free accommodation, food, transportation, and financial support is available for you. Minister Allard, who has helped to oversee the coordination of this as Minister responsible for the Emergency Management Agency, will provide additional details on the criteria to qualify and the costs uh, of this critical support.
We are also working to ensure awareness of local testing centers in the most affected communities and access to them through transportation services. And we'll be providing information to encourage the use of safe vaccines as community groups have reported to us that there are some widespread misconceptions about the safety of vaccination uh, in some communities. Alberta's government is also launching a renewed public awareness campaign in 10 different languages across uh, conventional and ethnocultural media, radio, television and print advertising as well as various social media uh, channels and web platforms to ensure that people have access to this information in the language that they can understand best. Uh, the COVID care team approach follows the advice of the World Health Organization, which has said that one of the most effective uh, strategies to control the virus is through strong, local, on-the-ground collaboration in communities that may be the most vulnerable. These on-the-ground groups and organizations have, we're talking here about ethnocultural groups, local neighborhood uh, organizations, uh, long-standing charities, settlement organizations that have helped, that help new, newcomers, uh, friendship centers in the indigenous communities, for example, um, and uh, faith-based organizations. Uh, these organizations have long-standing relationships with their community members, as well as knowledge about what works and what's needed on a more granular and personal level. That, combined with the support of Alberta's government, can provide information and practical help to Albertans in a way that uh, they are most comfortable with, which helps us to ensure that we're reaching out in a respectful and sensitive manner. So before I hand things over uh, to Minister Allard, I'd like to thank the municipal and community partners in Calgary and Edmonton for their collaboration on this outreach program. I began talking uh, to Mayors uh, Iverson and Nenshi about this two weeks ago as we began framing uh, this program and want to thank all of those involved in the uh, collaborative tables in both cities for taking a Team Alberta approach to make this happen very quickly. I'll now ask Minister Aller to uh, share uh, the details of the community care program and I think we'll then hear from uh, Minister Madhu who is uh, helping to, to chair the table here in Edmonton and then from uh, Dr. Hinshaw on today's daily update. Well, thank you very much, Premier. As Premier stated, uh, it's our pleasure to announce new outreach efforts to support neighbourhoods dealing with significant spread of the COVID-19 virus. COVID care teams, as we're calling them, will help us reach across barriers in significant ways and provide these communities with up-to-date information and supports they need to keep them and their families safe. As Premier mentioned, we've identified 11 areas or hot zones where there are highest rates of COVID-19 transmission in the province. Nine of these zones are here in Edmonton and two are in Calgary. In Calgary, COVID care teams will be reaching out to residents in the upper Northeast and lower Northeast areas. In Edmonton, COVID care teams will be focusing on a number of neighborhoods as follows, the Northeast, Northgate, Castle Downs, Woodcroft West, Jasper Place, Woodcroft East, Eastwood, Abbotsfield, and Mill Woods West. COVID care teams will be comprised of on the ground community groups and organizations who've built long standing, trusted relationships with these community members. They will include municipal and provincial resources, community organizations, cultural organizations, translators, social workers, faith leaders, and settlement organizations. The makeup of each of the COVID care teams will vary based on the unique needs of each area or zone. In addition to language supports, we will be offering a number of services, including clarifying health orders and instructions, providing care packages, as Premier mentioned, with masks and hand sanitizer, as well as providing information on how to access isolation accommodation, transportation services as needed, and local assessment centers for testing. Outreach support workers will be on the ground to offer care packages and information, as well as answer any questions. 
Engagement will also occur at transit stations and other places where people naturally pass through and can safely receive information and care packages. And I want to reiterate, we are doing this because you matter. Your health and your safety matters, your communities matter, and your families matter. By working together and taking a safe, coordinated, and community-minded approach, we will ensure residents have the understanding, the tools, the supports they need to break the chain of transmission in these communities. I'd like to personally thank all involved for coming together to meet this moment as Albertans and support these communities. And now I believe we have Minister Sani with us virtually, and it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, Minister Rajan Sani, Minister of Community and Social Services. Thank you. Thank you kindly, Minister Allard, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for this opportunity to support this very important initiative. I truly believe working with community members and local leaders will provide us the best opportunity to reduce the spread of COVID. I take my role very seriously in leading this effort in Calgary, and I encourage leaders within the impacted communities in both Edmonton and Calgary to help us spread the word about resources and services that are available. COVID doesn't discriminate. Its presence is felt in every community across the province, but the impact it has in certain communities is clearly more prevalent. As Minister of Community and Social Services, I see that impact on vulnerable populations every day. I understand the importance of being careful not to stigmatize people while recognizing some people will need more assistance than others in understanding the public health guidance and measures required to keep themselves safe and to keep their families safe. Helping people understand at the community level is paramount and so important. And I appreciate the support communities are providing to this initiative. I look forward to seeing the positive impacts of this initiative and how it will help decrease the transmission of COVID. Together, we will make a difference and together we will save lives because you matter. It's my pleasure now to introduce my colleague, Minister Madhu. Thank you, uh, Premier and Ministers. As you have heard, our government believes that keeping Albertans informed about measures aimed at containing this pandemic is absolutely critical for the health and safety of all Albertans. The current pandemic requires all of us to pull together and look out for each other. And sure enough, everyone has been pitching in we have all seen stories about medical workers who have gone above and beyond, working themselves to the point of exhaustion to provide treatment and comfort to the patients in their care. Frontline workers in many sectors throughout our province have set a wonderful example of how people are adapting and taking the necessary precautions in order to continue assisting fellow Albertans. At a time like this, accurate information is key, especially when it can seem that medical misinformation spreads even more easily than the virus. Today, we enter a critical new phase of our pandemic strategy. If we are to succeed, it's vital that Albertans, and especially those in the hardest hit communities, can find about the new help now available to them. It's crucial that we provide not only information, but the resources these communities need to meaningfully prevent, to help prevent the virus from spreading, whether to friends, family, or colleagues. I thank everyone who will be on the ground in these communities for the difference they will make in the lives of many, including those we hold so dear to our heart. 
Uh, with that, I would like to invite the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Dina Henshaw, for her daily remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Good afternoon, everyone. As you heard earlier, over the last 24 hours, we have identified 1,341 new cases of COVID-19 in Alberta and completed about 16,350 new tests. This means our positivity rate currently stands at 8.2%. This is a continuation of the plateau in cases that I talked about yesterday. As the Premier mentioned, there are 742 people in hospital, including 137 who have been admitted to the ICU. These hospital numbers continue to be alarming. As I have said before, this pandemic has not stopped all of the other health issues that Albertans face every day. Babies are still being born, People are suffering from heart attacks and having car collisions. Every COVID-19 hospitalization is an additional stress on our acute care system. We each need to continue to do everything we can to help prevent one more person from ending up in hospital for our health, for our loved ones, for our health care workers and for the system that we all rely on. Sadly, 11 new deaths were reported to us in the last 24 hours. My thoughts and sympathies are with all those grieving the loss of family or friends from any cause. Looking to schools, there are currently active alerts or outbreaks in 456 schools or about 19% of all schools in the province. Currently, these schools have a combined total of 1,943 cases. This number includes 129 schools on the watch list. While junior and senior high students are currently learning at home, these outbreak numbers do include junior and senior high schools for transparency and completeness. COVID-19 has taught us many things over the past year, including patience, perseverance and perspective. But I think the biggest lesson is about shared responsibility. Just like no one measure alone can put an end to this virus, no one person can stop it either. The only way we can get transmission under control is by all of us doing our part. For the rest of the month, we all need to make good choices and to rigorously follow all legal orders in place. This includes not crowding into shopping malls or other retail locations. We have implemented capacity limits for a reason. It is essential that we limit in-person interaction and gatherings, including those that happen in malls. It is critical that you stay physically distanced from anyone outside your household, and this includes any time you are inside a mall. We will be reaching out again to operators this week to ensure they're aware of the new measures. And I also want to reinforce these are legal orders. If we don't see compliance, Alberta Health Services and law enforcement are able to take action. I also ask all Albertans to help out. If you see a mall is crowded, consider returning at another time or arranging for curbside pickup. If you are going shopping, go with just one person or perhaps, if two, with only your household members. Together we can protect each other and our healthcare system and show the rest of the country who Albertans are. People who work together to protect each other. Thank you, and we're happy to take questions. As always, there are a lot of reporters in the queue today, so I would ask everyone to be brief and limit yourself to one question. Operator, can you please put through the first caller? First is Rick Bell with the Calgary Sun. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, question for the Premier. Uh, a few minutes ago, Premier, you said hope is here and the end of this terrible time is within sight. But here in Calgary, we saw the municipal mask bylaw extended to a year 
uh, over the objection of a sizable but minority number of councillors who wanted to look at it again in June. And the mayor of Calgary yesterday said that he didn't want to give us false hope, quote unquote, because he didn't think things such as the mask bylaw would be removed until September at the earliest. Um, so I'm very confused. Perhaps you could explain um, what the situation, what you feel the situation really is as far as going forward. Well, the situation today is obviously very serious, Rick. Even though we've seen cases plateau, which is good news, we continue to see uh, slight increases in hospitalizations. Uh, and uh, so uh, let me just say that the plateau thankfully happened based on the policies we had in place in November. Uh, and that, so we can reasonably expect that the uh, difficult but more stringent measures announced a week ago today which largely came into effect just this past weekend, um, will take us from a plateau to declining uh, case counts to release uh, reduce pressure on the healthcare system. Our own timeline is this, Rick. Uh, I can't speak for uh, the mayor or Calgary City Council, but on behalf of the government of Alberta, our timeline is the following. The uh, restrictions we put in place this weekend will be effective for four weeks to uh, give us enough time uh, hopefully to see, to make a real difference uh, in reducing pressure on the health care system. We will then reassess those restrictions. Uh, if, heaven forbid, we've not been successful and the plateau starts to pick up again, notwithstanding these restrictions, uh, uh, we'll have to uh, uh, respond accordingly. But I'm, I'm truly hopeful that with the plateau we have now, and a declining case in, in uh, hospitalizations we expect over the next month, that we may be able to look at some targeted relaxations. Um, by the end of March, we will have hopefully vaccinated 10% uh, of our population, including the most vulnerable, the very elderly and frail uh, seniors in uh, nursing homes and uh, frontline nurses and, and healthcare workers. That will be a game changer. It should result in a significant decrease in uh, the fatality rate from COVID-19. But we won't be out of the woods on, uh, at the end of March because we've still mo got, got to move on to, to inoculate more seniors. Uh, the average age of hospitalizations is 60. I mean, a lot of folks in their 50s who are not passing away from COVID, but they are getting sick and ending up in hospital beds. So, um, We'll, con you know, we'll, we'll continue to assess this uh, month by month and week by week as we go through the first six months of next year. Uh, I, I do believe there is, uh, look, it's not, it's not time to break out the, uh, the noisemakers and the party hats right now by any means, but I do think we can realistically hope uh, for a significant relaxation in COVID public health measures as we move from spring into the summer. Uh, until we get community immunity, which likely will not be until the fall, uh, we likely won't be able to eliminate all of the uh, public health measures. But I I'm not prepared to sit here and predict what policies we're going to need uh, a, a, a year from now. Um, I think it's important that we, we be just absolutely blunt with Albertans, that uh, we're in tough right now. Things are going to start getting better uh, if, we, if we stick to our, uh, the rules in, in the first part of next year. Uh, and, and let's hope that in the latter half of this year, we'll be back to much more something like normal. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Next is Dean Bennett with the Canadian Press. Go ahead, Dean. Thanks very much. I think this is for the Premier, uh, it's a policy thing. So, so we've got the first vaccine today, and unfortunately history shows us that once the lineup starts, people try to butt in line. I think we all remember in 2009 when the Calgary Flames and their families, 150 of them uh, jumped ahead uh, for, 100, for uh, the H1N1. Premier, what is your uh, government going to do to make sure that this doesn't happen, yeah. what safeguards are in place, and will you have any kind of penalties for those who uh, jump the queue? Very good question, Dean. We, I've, we first saw that uh, when we first started discussing uh, the vaccine rollout, that there was going to be all sorts of pressure. And I said at our very first uh, cabinet discussion on this, I said, we must uh, build a, uh, 
a absolute wall to ensure around the vaccination program to ensure that there is no political pressure of any kind on uh, who gets vaccinated when. I don't want MLAs from I don't care what party saying that the nursing home in their constituency or somebody, a constituent's mom uh, needs to go first. We have to have this run uh, impartially, uh, objectively by uh, expert officials and, and I have confidence in them. Um, Alberta Health Services has been working on this for months. I'm, I've been, a, I think, persuaded that they have a very well developed and exercised vaccine distribution program using objective criteria for prioritizing uh, who uh, gets into that queue you, that you've described. Um, and then uh, we've also um, brought in to ensure uh, an additional level of oversight the uh, vaccination task force chaired by Deputy Minister and former uh, Lieutenant General Paul Winnick uh, to, to also bring a, 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 a logistics lens to the whole process. So I'm confident that we've got the protocols in place. In terms of penalties, I don't know. I haven't thought th that through, but um, I'll, I've, I've said to my colleagues uh, that, that no minister, no MLA, nobody involved in the po a political side of government should be picking up any phone to say that so-and-so should be jumping this queue. Having said that, uh, Dean, while we have a priority um, protocol in place, I know that we'll be getting submissions from different industries uh, that will be making a, a case that perhaps pe people delivering critical services, essential services, uh, uh, should be uh, somewhere earlier in the schedule of vaccinations. We'll let the officials assess that. You know, I'll give you an example. I know that in, um, in order to keep the lights on, the power producers uh, took, went to extreme lengths to quarantine, sometimes for months, the most core essential service workers in um, the entire hydroelectricity grid in the province. That's the kind of thing you cannot uh, risk going down. So if there are, I'm just using that as, a, as an example where I do expect there will be the emergency management agency and the vaccine task force may get industry specific requests to support workers in truly essential core services. I don't see that as political in, uh, interference or queue jumping, but it is a consideration that probably should be taken into account. And that would include things like, you know, when do you bring in the police and, 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 and the uh, paramedics, uh, firefighters. Uh, you can go through lots of different uh, essential services and, and have to determine, you know, which one of these require faster attention in the vaccination program. We'll leave that determination to the experts. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Next is Jeff Slack with 660 News. Go ahead, Jeff. Hi there. This question is either for the Premier or Dr. Hinshaw. Uh, what's the province's plan to track who's been vaccinated? Will this be made public similar to the flu vaccine? Doctor? I think I know the answer, but I suspect Dr. Hinshaw knows it better than me. So. We are working to uh, put together public reporting, which will include the number of people who have been immunized uh, in the different zones, and we'll make sure that that information is available publicly, just as we do with influenza immunization. Uh, the other thing that we've often been asked is whether people will get a record of their immunization, and that will happen. So people will get a paper copy when they've been immunized that has that vaccine record on it. And that will also go into the electronic record. And people who have access to My Health Records will be able to go into that system and print out their vaccination record at any time in the future should they need that record of immunization. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Next is Janet French uh, with CBC. Go ahead, Janet. Hi there. My question is for Dr. Henshaw. <clears throat> Could we please get an update on how the contact tracing recruitment is going? Do you have an updated number of how many folks are doing that work, <clears throat> how many are still in training, and what is the sort of timeline to, to ramp up? You know, last we heard was end of December to get all these tra this trace number of tracers doubled. You know, we're hearing that some schools are not going to be doing notifications over the Christmas holidays. And so I suppose the question that raises is, is AHS ready to keep up with those notifications in a timely fashion while schools are going to be shut down? 
Thanks for the question. And uh, those numbers are continually changing because, of course, Alberta Health Services is in an ongoing process to recruit contact tracers. So for today's most recent update, uh, we'll have to get back to you with respect to where AHS is at on the numbers of people that have been hired, the number of uh, FTE hours that are being worked. But the, uh, that work is ongoing and of course those people who are in those positions are working incredibly hard to be able to reach out to those individuals who've been diagnosed as cases of COVID-19 and contacts. Uh, with respect to schools, as you say, there are um, reports that uh, some school boards are not uh, going to be able to provide that uh, contact uh, list uh, with respect to the, the class lists over the break. So we're working with Health Services to understand what options we have when an individual may be diagnosed with COVID-19, perhaps was infectious while in a class. Uh, and if we're not able to access those lists, we'll have to, to consider what other options we have to be able to make that information available to potential contacts. So again, that's a, a solution that we're working on and, and don't have a, a firm answer at this time, uh, but it is under discussion. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Next is Lauren Boothby with the Edmonton Journal. Go ahead, Lauren. Hi, this is for the Premier. Um, what outreach have you been doing for Albertans whose first language isn't English up until now? Um, also, other regions in Canada identified um, some lower income neighborhoods or communities um, that were seeing higher spread and barriers and taking advantage of some of the COVID programs months ago. So you said statistical analysis was done. So what specifically have you been looking at to determine these neighborhoods and communities? And why is this uh, just being launched now? A lot of good questions there. First of all, the statistical analysis is based just primarily on the uh, incidence of active COVID cases in particular local geographic areas. Uh, and uh, in these particular areas, uh, you know, for example, uh, Cal Calgary Upper Northeast, um, nearly 1,400 cases per 100,000. At its peak, they had reached, I think, 1,600 per 100,000, uh, nearly 1,600 current active cases. That would be uh, the highest. Uh, so we're, we're taking sort of the, the very top uh, of, of the roughly 230 local geographic regions or areas, we're taking the top 11, um, and they all tend to have the common characteristics of being uh, lower income neighborhoods with higher uh, housing density. Um, and we believe uh, probably disproportionate num number of people working in uh, essential frontline service jobs uh, being more exposed to community transmission and uh, more likelihood of English language barriers. So um, we have been reaching out uh, to this. I, would, I don't want to give the impression that uh, this is the beginning of our outreach efforts. In fact, uh, we have been, we ha have had community outreach efforts to ethnocultural communities uh, who might have English language barriers uh, from March. I, I was, I, I'm thinking back now to those very first meetings. I was very pointed about that this because as the former federal minister for multiculturalism and immigration, I was aware of um, of some of the the new unique barriers uh, that many of those communities would be facing, particularly uh, those who arrived in Canada as uh, resettled refugees um, who. Um, are often most um, at, at risk of uh, for a number of reasons. So we have had a very large uh, advertising program, translating materials, working with community leaders. Um, but what I'm saying now is I, I, we've recognized that is not sufficient. And um, we need to step it up in a significant way, given the prevalence of active cases in some of these uh, neighborhoods. And um, and so I, I you know I, I must tell you I've been raising the alarm about this internally for for months, but I, I think we I think the system had a hard time knowing how practically can we do different do do something different how could apart from just translating materials and handing out brochures to cultural communities uh, and doing advertising in ethnocultural media what more can we do. And essentially, the, the, the core of this announcement is a massive expansion of self-isolation support. Uh, the observation is this. Many jurisdictions that have gone to so-called hard lockdown policies on a sustained basis have actually seen cases stubbornly not go down, in some cases they've actually gone up. Um, 
And uh, I think that's partly because uh, you can shut down every, all the businesses, all social I interaction, but if transmission continues at home, at people's homes, and if you have eight or 10 or 12 people living in a small home or an apartment, chances are they cannot effectively self-isolate despite the, their best efforts and transmission, transmission is just gonna go by, from person to person in a home like that. We need to be there, not just with information, but with practical support. Our hunch is the vast majority of those, house, that kind of, um, those kinds of households are not aware that they can get free isolation support at a hotel with culturally appropriate food and other support, with free transportation, and now with the added, frankly, the financial incentive to do this, to help cover off some of the associated costs. Ours is the first province in Canada to do this. Um, I think with the exception of the state of Victoria in Australia, that's the only other jurisdiction, and to some extent South Korea and Taiwan, those are the only other jurisdictions I know that are providing direct financial support to people who self-isolate in this way. Uh, it, we're going to do this on, a, on, a, on an eight-week basis as, as a pilot uh, to see at, if it works. We'll expand it and roll it out from there. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Next is Kenny Trenton with Kix FM. Go ahead, Kenny. Uh, thank you. My question is for uh, Minister Allard. Um, so I missed the first part of it. What would the uh, payment for isolating in a hotel would be for 14 days and uh, other types of uh, supports that are available for anyone that needs to access it? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, so the payment will flow to people who are isolating in a hotel who are unable to isolate at home and are under isolation order. And as we know from Alberta Health Services, isolation orders range between 10 and 14 days. And so the payment will be $625 and that's tax free. And that will flow to the person after they complete their isolation protocol. In addition to that payment from the Alberta provincial government, there is a Canada wide government uh, subsidy of $500 per week uh, with some provisos. So the combination of those two things would be the financial benefit. In addition to the financial benefit, as Premier mentioned, we'll be offering other supports as required. And we didn't get into many of the details, but when you are isolating in a hotel, we offer things like prescription refills, uh, services to your eyeglasses, um, other supports as needed, pickup of packages for you. So we want to be very sensitive. This is a program of compassion. That's why we called it the community care teams. We were really wanting to lead the way as Albertans to work together to uh, bend the curve and stop the spread. Thank you for the question. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Next is Kevin Nimick with CTV Calgary. Go ahead, Kevin. Hi there, this is a question for the Premier and Minister Shandro, but uh, Dr. Hinshaw may also want to weigh in. It's a similar question to what uh, Janet French asked earlier. I'm wondering about contact tracers. We've been hearing for weeks that uh, there's a lot of effort being made to hire uh, many more contact tracers, but uh, the problem with unknown cases seemingly hasn't gone away. We're at 80% uh, of all active cases are unknown right now. What are some of the challenges you're facing in trying to recruit and hire workers for these positions? That's a good question. I'm, I'm sorry that, uh, you know, I get um, weekly briefings on the efforts to expand our contact tracing workforce and uh, system, and I just don't have, uh, I get a mountain of information every week. I don't have those stats in front of me. I, I would say that AHS is making uh, steady progress. I mean, when we started all of this, I think back in, in early March, we were at something like 35 contact tracers. We ramped that up to about 850. Um, uh, I learned, uh, not, it, it, I think this fall, that many of them were actually working part-time, which uh, I, I, we gave the direction to try to transition as many to full-time as possible. And basically, we indicated that there was, there was no budget limit on this, uh, that they should be going uh, as, as hard and fast as they possibly could to hire more people, train them up. One of the issues that has been raised by AHS, AHS with us uh, throughout uh, COVID is uh, that they do need um, a certain skill level to do some of this work. Uh, and so at a, at a certain level, they've been uh, setting aside positions for people with some degree of, of, of medical training for nurses and, uh, and other uh, certified professionals. Uh, so it's not 
these are not all jobs that just regular lay people can step into and, and get soft touch uh, training. Our direction as the cabinet COVID uh, committee has been um, not to make the perfect the enemy of the good and, and uh, just to uh, try to train up uh, people with some relevant uh, uh, capabilities as quickly as they could. There's been all sorts of um, innovative efforts of late including uh, contracting a labor recruiting firm uh, to assist them. I know that uh, WestJet reached out and said they have a lot of furloughed, thousands of furloughed employees here in Alberta, many of whom might like to support the program. And as a result, we reached out to those folks and we now have, I think, last count, 32 furloughed WestJet employees, including one pilot, who are now part of our contact tracing team. So I think we're up uh, around 1,100. I don't know the current FTE number. Uh, but we'll get back to you on that. Um, I, I am confident that as you know, we're, we're going in a good direction here. As cases seem to have plateaued, we have not yet seen the impact of the most recent restrictions. Um, as we continue to surge uh, the number of FTEs that are trained uh, in the contact tracing operation, um, I, I'm, I'm optimistic that at some point in the first quarter of next year, we'll be able to get back on top of this in terms of tracing new cases. Okay, we have time for three more. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? And, and to the last question, uh, I'm sorry that, uh, yeah. sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, he asked to, to hear from Minister Shander. He's not, not part of today's uh, briefing, but uh, if I could ask the comms uh, people who are uh, monitoring this to get back to those journalists with more um, detailed numerical updates on where we're at with contact tracing. Go ahead, operator. Okay, next is Julia Wong with Global News. Go ahead, Julia. Hi, this question is for Dr. Hinshaw. You mentioned recently the lab is pushing the ceiling when it comes to testing capacity. And you've also said in the past that surge capacity was never meant to be a daily thing. So with the numbers that we're seeing now, is surge capacity the new baseline? And if so, how much more capacity can be built? And how do you assure Albertans the lab has the resources to deal with these high testing numbers? You're right that uh, 23,000 was the surge capacity and we're also of course seeing very high volumes right now. We have been working with the lab to make sure that uh, we're thinking through all the different options available with respect to lab testing capacity in the province and using alternate resources. So for example, with the border testing pilot, uh, brought on board some additional testing capacity outside of the public system to make sure that we were not impacting wait times for people through the, the main testing process. Uh, so there's examples like that that are, are being used to make sure again that, that reutilizing not just uh, one piece of our infrastructure that's available in the province but anywhere where we can leverage existing uh, capacity resources um, and experienced staff to be able to do the testing. And uh, part of the reason that we've been able to build so quickly to this kind of capacity is the expertise of the Alberta Precision Laboratories and in partnership with DynaLife being able to bring ourselves up to this kind of sustained volume. Uh, of course, as is always the case, there's global demand for testing that's very high. Uh, and so the, the team always is working to make sure that our supply chain is managed, uh, that our equipment is maintained. And like any other um, system, sometimes there are issues that need to be fixed, but the lab has done a tremendous job in maintaining that capacity. And I think Albertans can be confident that the people who are working in that lab system uh, have delivered a world-class product. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Next is Don Braid with the Calgary Herald. Go ahead, Don. I had three questions. They've all been answered. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks, Don. Operator, can you please put through the final caller? Okay, the final question is Francois Jolie with Radio Canada. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is a question in French for uh, Premier Kenny. Uh, Monsieur Kenny, uh, vous avez présenté uh, plusieurs uh, mesures pour fournir de l'information sur la vaccination uh, aux communautés culturelles, notamment, que vous avez annoncé aujourd'hui. Uh, on a vu un sondage aujourd'hui, 27% des Albertains, 27% des Albertains n'ont pas l'intention de se faire vacciner. Alors, selon vous, est-ce que c'est un problème, surtout dans les communautés culturelles en Alberta, le, le, la réticence face au vaccin? Je dirais que c'est un défi général. Évidemment, il y a pas mal de personnes qui sont sceptiques 
En ce qui concerne les vaccinations générales et euh, les vaccinations de COVID-19 en particulier, euh, mais euh, j'ai vu les sondages aux États-Unis qui indiquent que euh, un large euh, nombre des, euh, des Afro-Américains sont très sceptiques en ce qui concerne envers euh, les programmes de vaccination. Comme vous savez, il y a eu une histoire euh, pénible euh, d'expérimentation de, de, euh, médicale et scientifique euh, euh, avec euh, les Afro-Américains. Et je crois que peut-être à cause de ça, il y a une certaine inquiétude. La, la dame euh, à l'Université de l'Alberta qui a reçu... Euh, le, le premier, la première vaccination aujourd'hui, euh, euh, elle s'appelle Chérie, euh, excusez-moi, I don't have that, uh, if I could get today's news release, I'd appreciate it for the uh, vaccination program. Mais la dame qui a été vaccinée à l'Université de l'Alberta aujourd'hui, elle a dit qu'elle vient de la communauté somal somalienne euh, et elle a dit que Uh, il y a beaucoup de, um, uh, de mythes en ce qui concerne les vaccinations uh, dans sa communauté et c'est la raison pour laquelle elle, elle a pris l'occasion de, 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 de prendre la première vaccination, d'envoyer un message de confiance. Alors, uh, je ne sais pas, je ne sais pas uh, au niveau des statistiques si c'est une attitude plus... Uh, prévalent, mais évidemment, il y a certaines communautés culturelles euh, avec une certaine euh, inquiétude. Et il faut, il faut tout simplement communiquer un message de confiance au, tout le, à tout le monde. Euh, évidemment, il y aura toujours un certain noyau des euh, anti-vaxxers qui sont carrément contre, et j'imagine qu'on ne peut rien faire pour euh, les persuader. Um, and uh, we can't find that release, but I'll... Um, I'll just refer you to the, okay, yeah, give that to me and I'll quote the individual. And this, the question was about whether we have any evidence that uh, particular cultural communities might be more anxious about taking the vaccine. I'm just going to quote from Sarah uh, Kayi, who is a respiratory therapist at the University of Alberta, uh, Capital Care Norwood and Glen Rose Rehabilitation Hospital. And Sarah said, quotes, I'm grateful to be one of the first healthcare workers in Alberta to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. I'm from the Somali community, and I want to set an example for my community. In Alberta, we've been battling vaccine misinformation for years, and uptake is especially challenging in marginalized communities. The availability of a COVID-19 vaccine is, a great, is great news for us. Uh, it will help us and will, it will protect us. So I think that's the kind of positive message and example uh, that we need to demonstrate to Albertans of all backgrounds. Merci. That concludes today's update. Uh, Dr. Hinshaw will be back again tomorrow afternoon.